Hey, welcome to StatsCast. My name's Chris. Today we're going to be learning about chi-squares, what they are, and how to use them. We're going to keep everything clear and simple, so it's no problem if you don't have any previous experience. Okay, so what is a chi-square? It's got kind of a funny name, a lot of folks find it a little confusing, but fortunately, it's actually really straightforward. A chi-square checks for patterns or relationships in categorical variables. That's all it does. Okay, great, but what is a categorical variable? It's any non-numeric characteristic. Examples of this could include gender or nationality. In contrast, a numeric variable would be something like length or weight that has a number in it. Categorical variables are things you can count, like how many boys or girls are in your class, but you can't do math with them directly because they aren't numbers. So what kind of questions can a chi-square answer? Let's look at some examples. Let's say you're playing a game and you suspect your friend is using loaded dice to cheat. You could tell if your friend's six-sided die is fair by rolling it lots of times, counting the results, and putting them in a table like this. Here we have one variable, which is the die roll, with six levels, which are the six possible outcomes. We call this a one-way chi-square because there's only one variable. You can do chi-squares with more than just one variable, though. You could look at whether participating in a study group is related to passing an exam, and count the number of students that fall into each category. Here we have two variables, being in a study group and passing an exam, each with two levels. We call this a two-by-two two design. Okay. So why not just look at the counts and see if they differ? The problem with that is we wouldn't know if a difference was just due to chance or if it's reliable. In other words, would we expect to see the same result if we did this again? This is the whole purpose of inferential statistics. They tell us how likely a pattern is to hold in the wider population, beyond just the data in our sample. Chi-square is not just telling us about the data we have, but the population of data we don't have. Let's take one more example and look at how we'd actually do a chi-square. Suppose your university wants to know if there's a gender balance across educational majors. In this case, engineering, business, and psychology. If there's no relationship, we would expect an even spread of genders across majors. But if there is a relationship, we would expect an uneven spread. Some majors would have more of one gender and others less. To solve the chi-square, we need to find two things. The value we would expect if there's no relationship and the actual value, which we'll call the observed value. So let's imagine there's no relationship. There's a completely even spread. We have 300 students evenly spread across majors and gender. If we put those counts in a table, it's called a contingency table. And if you're doing chi-squares by hand, you'll probably be familiar with these. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably sick of contingency tables. So let's put this same information in a chart. You can see a perfectly even spread. Now let's put a dashed line there to mark where we'd expect the counts to fall if there's no relationship. OK, so that's what we'd expect. But what would the real data show us? The real data shows there are some differences. There are more men in engineering and more women in business and psychology. You can see our bars no longer fall on the dashed line of what we might expect. If we quantify this, we see engineering's off by 10 for both men and women, while business and psychology are both off by 5. These differences from the expected value are highlighted here. Remember, the purpose of the chi-square is to tell us if these deviations of what we would expect are big enough to be reliable differences. That is, if we collected new data, would we expect to see the same deviations from the expected value, or is this just a coincidence? That's what a chi-square tells us. And believe it or not, we now have everything we need to calculate the chi-square value. So let's take a look. Okay, thankfully the formula is really simple. 
All we do is take the differences from what we would expect, square it, and divide by the expected value. Let's take a look at our chart to see where these values come from. Our expected value is the dashed line. It's what we would expect if there were no relationship and the counts were evenly spread. In this case, it's 50 for all combinations of gender and major. These little highlighted sections are the differences between what we'd expected and what we observed. In this case, they're all tens or fives. This is the top half of our equation. When you put it all together, you get your chi-square value. We represent this with the Greek letter chi, which looks like a fancy letter x. Okay, let's work through an example. Let's take our first group, women in engineering. We have an observed value of 40 and an expected value of 50. So we fill those in the formula. 40 minus 50 is negative 10. That's why there's a negative 10 in the lighter section of the bar. If we square negative 10, we get 100. 100 over 50 is 2. So our chi-square value for this first group is 2. Note that the next group, which is men in engineering, would also have a chi-square value of 2, because the observed value is also 10 away from the expected value. OK, so that takes care of our first two groups. Let's look at the next group, which is women in business. Our expected value is still 50, and our observed value is now 55. That's 5 more than expected. That's the darker yellow section of the bar chart. If we square 5, we get 25. 25 divided by 50 is 1 half. So our chi-square value is 1 half, or 0 0.5. OK, now let's add it all together. Our first two groups, engineering, were 10 above or below the expected value, so they get a chi-square value of 2. The next two bars, business, were 5 above or below the expected value, so they get a chi-square value of 0.5. Psychology was also 5 above or below the expected value, so they also get a chi-square value of 0.5. It's important to note that although the engineering value is twice as far from the expected value as business or psychology, that's 10 compared to 5, the chi-square value is four times as large for this group, 2 instead of 1 half. That's a pretty big difference. Because we're squaring the differences, that's the square in chi-square, we magnify the effect of bigger differences and minimize smaller differences. Add it all together, 2 plus 2 plus 4 halves, and we get a sum chi-square value of 6. So there you have it. The total chi-square value equals 6. OK, great. The chi-square value is 6. Now what? Remember, we're trying to figure out if this difference is reliable. To answer that, each chi-square has a p-value. This tells us if the chi-square found a reliable pattern or not, or if the differences are too small to be reliable. We call this statistical significance. You can think of the p-value as the probability that the pattern produced by our data could be produced by random data. So a p-value of 0.05 means there's only a 5% chance that we would get these results with random data. A p-value of 0.01 means there's only a 1% chance we'd get these results with random data, while 0.1 means there's a 10% chance. Typically, the cutoff for significance is a p-value of 0.05 or below. OK, let's talk about sample size. Chi-square has some unique considerations. You need to have at least one case in every cell in the table, no zero counts allowed. Also, at least 80% of your cells should have a count of five or more, though some say all cells should have a count of five or more. There's one more value we need to talk about. That's degrees of freedom. This helps determine the exact p-value for the chi-square value. If you're doing chi-squares by hand, you'd look this up in a table. 
Finding the DF, or degrees of freedom, is really easy. We just take the levels of each variable, subtract 1, and multiply. Unlike with some other tests, the sample size doesn't matter with our degrees of freedom. It's just the number of levels. So in our example, gender has two levels. Subtract 1 to get 1. Major had three levels. Subtract 1 to get 2. 1 times 2 is 2, so we have two degrees of freedom. Now that's pretty easy, but if you want something even easier, just look at your contingency table. Take away one row and one column and count the number of cells you have left. So let's take them away and see what's left. One, two. That's it. Two degrees of freedom. There are a bunch of variations of chi-square, but really only two you're likely to encounter. These are the test of independence and the goodness of fit. Now, I'll be honest with you. For all their talents, statisticians are not great at naming things. And these names are not especially descriptive or intuitive. So let me describe exactly what these are and what they do. First, let's talk about the test of independence. And it sounds pretty impressive, right? This checks to see if categorical variables are independent or if they are related to each other. This is the kind of test we just did with gender and major. Although it's called a test of independence, I like to think of it more as a test of relationship because we're usually more interested in significant results than non-significant ones. Either way, it's telling you if categorical variables have any influence on each other. The funny thing about the test of independence is that while it's probably the most common type of chi-square, it's not usually referred to by its full name. Most people just call it a chi-square. So if someone asks you to do a chi-square and doesn't specify what kind, this is probably the one they're talking about. The other kind of test isn't quite as common, but you'll probably encounter it at some point. This is the goodness of fit test. Now I'll admit, it's not a great name. It sounds like something a shoe salesman would do to find you the perfect pair of shoes. The goodness of fit test compares how well categorical variables in your sample match the distribution of a hypothetical value or a known population value. An example would be comparing gender and major at your university to the distribution at the national level. Not defined if gender and major influence each other, but to see if your university differs from the national level. The big difference here is our expected values. They don't come from assuming an even spread, like in a test of independence. They come directly from the hypothesized or known population value. Because this test is less common, people usually use its full name when referring to it. Okay, let's talk about limitations and assumptions. As non-parametric tests, meaning they don't use numbers like means, chi-squares are actually robust against the normal limitations for parametric tests, like t-tests and ANOVAs. So you don't need normal data or similar group sizes. In fact, if your data violated a bunch of these limitations, doing a chi-square might be your answer instead of doing a parametric test. So in that sense, chi-squares are very robust. But the big limitation with chi-squares is you need to have a value of at least 1 in every cell. And at least 80% of your table values should be at least 5. This could be a problem if you have a very small sample or very low frequency categories. Another limitation is that a significant chi-square doesn't tell you which levels of your variables are driving the effect. Now with simple problems, you can usually figure that out by looking at it. But with complex designs with many variables or levels, they can be difficult to interpret. Then there are the limitations that go with all inferential statistics. One is that you can only generalize your results to a population that resembles your sample. So our example with gender and major might generalize to our university, because that's where our sample came from, but not to another university that may be quite different. Finally, all data should be independent. 
This means one case doesn't influence any other case. If your data breaks some of these rules, you do have options. If you have empty cells or too many low count cells, you may want to combine certain categories into a bigger category. You can also drop certain levels from your analysis altogether. Alternatively, you could collect more data to help fill out your table. If you have a very complex chi-square design, such as one with many variables or many levels of variables, you can decompose the total chi-square value into its component parts. You may want to look at your data in other ways with other tests too. Last, let's talk about how to write up a chi-square. Thankfully, it's really simple. As always, writing styles may vary, but this is pretty typical. First, give the name of the test, and then the statistical values. The chi-square value tells us the size of the difference, and the p-value tells us if this is significant or not. If the p-value is less than 0.05, then the difference is considered statistically significant. In our case, we did find a significant difference. Degrees of freedom go in parentheses. Finally, say whether this indicates a relationship or not. You don't need to list counts or means like you might with a parametric test. All right, that's it for today. If you found this helpful, check out our other videos. We cover a wide range of stats concepts, as well as how-to videos that walk you through how to do stats, both by hand and with a computer. Bye for now.